from the only place in Oregon, Portland. Uh, if you came in late and you are interested in becoming part of the consortium of accountants we are hoping to put together to work in the cannabis industry, a colleague here has the bag. We will not sell your information. We will not put you on some sort of an email list. We will not do all that garbage. Things. We hate spam just as much as you do. I'm really excited. Thank you all for showing up. I have walked around this place and it's been interesting to think about. I thought I was going to have a room when I got to now to compete against the panel back there. Again, I'm a certified public accountant. I've been working since 2012 in the organ industry. Um, if you're doing the home game, that is a number of years before adult recreational use in Oregon. They legalized in 2015. I have translated a lot of black market people into the traditional market for tax. They are interesting people. I encourage you all to look at them as uh, the individuals they are, because they're just folk trying to have a job. So, a bit about me. I've been working in the industry again, private practice, uh, since 2012. Prior to that, I worked in a public accounting firm doing audits, which I think is important for this industry, uh, and tax return work for small and medium-sized business, also important to know about this industry, businesses. And before that, I came to public accounting uh, through the unconventional means of an insult that is masquerading as a dare. In 2003, I used to work for a court system in Multnomah County as a program coordinator for a therapeutic drug court. I was dealing with the receipts at the end of the grant year and found that there had been some purchases uh, done improperly. No big deal. Brought that to my superior, who turned on me and said, You don't know what you're talking about. You're not a public accountant. I was surprised. I was like, wow, you can just pay back the $2,600. I mean, not that big a deal, right? Now, it turned out um, I was right, and I did know what I was talking about. And now I'm a certified public account. <laughs> so during the course of my many careers, both inside and outside of public accounting, I have had a lot of people ask me to put my reputation, my license, and even my freedom on the line. You will be asked to do that if you go into this industry, but you don't have to. We're public accountants. We are ready and capable to be able to be independent from our clients and be able to make the decisions that they need to have to be able to work in this kind of an environment. I've seen firsthand that without somebody like me and you in this conversation, that these people won't file tax returns. It's terrifying to them. You think the regular 1040 is bad or the 1120S, oh my god. These people need us and they're willing to pay us for that. So today, I'm going to give you a synopsis of the roadmap that I use for how to get into this industry and work in it in a way that doesn't compromise your ethics. Should you so choose, please. Not required. Option. I call it the four no's of cannabis accounting. Here we go. Know thy client. Know thy regulatory environment. California, you're six months in, you don't know yet. Just kidding. No problem. Know thy tax code and thy tax position. But most importantly, you need to know thyself. That's you. So, here we go. Know thy client. Why? Origin stories matter. Your origin story, my origin story, their origin story. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to these clients, period. Their situation is unique to them, even if it's not unique to you. How do you know your client? I do an initial consultation. I we all do an initial consultation, never for free. Your time is valuable, period. You have specialized, or will, have specialized knowledge in this area. These people need you, and they need to pay you. 
I have met fabulous fortune stories in my initial consultation. One of my first was a 78-year-old man with a $1 million net operating loss carried forward that he decided he was going to use up in cannabis before he dies. An odd reason to get into the industry. He's doing a really good job at using it up in the test. I have met the Miami Mafia. I have met the Cuban Mafia. I have met newlyweds that were absolutely convinced that two years of selling weed was going to buy them a house outright in cash. They're here, people. <laughs> Do an initial consultation and make it long enough that you're going to be able to get into the nitty gritty of what is happening with these clients. The time you spend now is going to be the time you save later. And it's going to be the time that you save not getting involved with a client that wants you to file them a fraudulent tax return. It takes an hour and a half, two hours, charge for it. It sets a precedent. If someone's going to bitch about your initial consultation rate, they're not going to pay you. When the tax returns ten, eight thousand dollars, I require an initial consultation. No exceptions. So do it. So, what are the characteristics of an effective initial consultation? I find uh, I have to differentiate what a CPA does from what an attorney does. We don't have privilege. They think we do. Please tell them that or they will tell you things you don't want to know about them right away. And then you might have to get an attorney involved right away. <laughs> Additionally, when we're talking about liability, we're talking about tax. We're not talking about kick down the door, be dragged out at 5 o'clock in the morning. We're talking about tax liability. They think that they're talking about criminal liability. That's what they have attorneys for. Attorneys are my single biggest referral source. And it's because criminal defense attorneys are talking to these people before anybody. And let me tell you, a criminal defense attorney, while lovely folk, should not explain what an LLC is to their clients. <laughs> I have that conversation more than almost any conversation I have. Because seven years in in, Cal in, in Colorado, I still have people that come all day long to my office and tell me that they, they're okay, they're an LLC, they're a corporation. They're a drinker. Great. In order to be involved in business, you got to pay a pound of flesh. I do. You do. Taxes are the biggest expense we have in our business. Just don't pay a pound and a half of flesh. Understand 280E, guys. Understand where you need to spend your money. Understand the code sections that are involved. The Controlled Substances Act. Read it. It's boring, but it's really informative. Code section 280E, code section 471, 263 cap A. Guess what? You can't use it. Read it anyway. DEA schedules. Those ones are super awesome. Especially if you're going to work with hemp. Extremely complicated right now. FDA regulations. There is something about cannabis or hemp or CBD or THC in all of those. And they contradict each other in glorious, glorious ways. But the meat and potatoes of the initial consultation, 280E. 280E. Where do you spend your money? How you bring value to your clients is you tell them where you spend your money. You roll out the old managerial accounting books and you get into code section 471. Full absorption costs for people. It's back. It's boring. And it's how you help your clients the most. If you can impress upon your client that none of their SGNA is deductible, none of their SGNA is deductible, none of their selling, general, or administrative expenses is deductible, and teach them how not to spend money there, you have made the money that you're going to pay them in spades. Ruthless control of expense is the make it or break it on this industry. 
I'd like to tell my clients it's a 90 hour a week job for $35,000 a year. It's not very far off. I conclude my initial consultation with a laundry list of things to bring me or to keep documentation requirements. As uh, Justin was alluding to, my very first client in cannabis after I did not have an initial consultation with him brought me nine months of sales receipts in three clear two-gallon plastic bags filled to the brim with sticky notes, undated. But each month was a different color. <laughs> Until he ran out of colors and began to recycle them. And I should have known then <laughs> that I was going to eat my shorts on that job and I did. Know thy clients. Know thy regulatory environment. You've got to stay current on the state laws and rules and regulations. In order to know that regulatory environment, though, you need to take care of yourself. Get an ethics attorney. Get a business attorney. For you, know the rules and regulations that are following you around. I was the first person to call the Board of Accountancy in Oregon in 2012 and say, hey, I think I want to work with the cannabis business. What do you think? And they were like, mm, well, we have no idea. Call your state society. And I called the state society. And they said, we have no idea. Call the AICPA. And so I called the AICPA and they said, be of good moral character. I was like, okay, well, um, I'm a CPA. I think I have to be a good moral character to get the license. And call your state society. Judith, she's over there. I had a great time. I've been in, I've yes. been, Janice, Janice, I've been in the state for 48 hours and I've talked to the California Society of CPAs. They're lovely. They're putting out October, August 10th, the, the cannabis forum. So check in with them. Since I called the state society, they refer me clients. When someone calls looking for a cannabis CPA, they refer clients to me. Those regulators are the people that you need to have your back if the federal government comes knocking. You're in compliance with state law and their state regulations to be able to practice accountancy here. They will help you. And make sure to understand your obligations under Circular 230. And if you're doing bookkeeping and non-test work, SARS 21, it matters. These people want documentations and you sometimes can't give it to them. So knowing the temperature of the bureaucrats involved in your industry is super important. And to know that client's regulatory industry, read those state laws, stay up on top of them. In the first 36 months in Oregon, they changed the laws 10 times. In September of 2016, they changed the testing requirements. September 30, I had a client with $100,000 in edibles. On October 1st, he couldn't sell them. They changed the testing requirements. you got to get involved and pay attention. You will become an unintentional advocate for very good people, very interesting people. Talk to your clients often enough to be up to date on the urban myths and the street knowledge that they're all passing around between each other, you would be surprised how many times this has undone months of solid accounting advice. If you haven't talked to your clients in a couple of months and they're not returning your emails, get prepared for them to show up with a situation that is on fire that they want you to try to fix. You, got, you can't do it once a year with these people. You've got to be in their business relationship. I would suggest subscribing to a daily digest of cannabis and hemp news. It changes all the time. The cannabis, the canna law blog is a great one. MJ Biz Daily, the um, folks that printed those schedules out, really important things to know. Know that tax position. Okay, so we've talked about 280E and all that, but according to the IRS, Colorado and California are the two states with the most open audits currently. The number one industry under audit, cannabis. It's happening. They're auditing 2010 and 11 and 12, but it's happening. 
they can audit that far back because these are clients that have already filed a tax return that's at least frivolous, but more often fraudulent. It's easy picking right now, guys, because no one would help them back then. You need to create defensible tax positions using the most current data. We use this SAPI, same as prior year approach. No, CYA guys. Document the file. Save your butts on this. This is a constantly evolving area, and I have found, especially in Oregon at least, city, county, state, federal laws are all jockeying for authority, with feds being the clear winner in that. The key to research uh, this, these positions is research, 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 research. The foundational code section is 280E. 280E, no credit or deduction shall be allowed for any amount paid or incurred during the taxable year in carrying on a trade or business if such business comprises of trafficking in a controlled substance within the bounds of Schedule 1 or Schedule 2 of the Controlled Substances Act, which is prohibited by federal and state law. It is as punitive as it sounds. And the first time that you roll out a 60 or a 70 or an $80,000 tax bill to an unsuspecting client, you too will go, <laughs> How do I help you? <laughs> I have to give this to you. <sighs> Read the poll memo, and despite the fact that the current AG has rolled it back, it is still what states are predicating their positions on. They are still trying to remain in compliance with that because that's what the rules were for so long. Read Code Section 471. You Full absorption cost and pull out the books from school. It's back. You cannot use code section 263 cap A in this business. There's one piece of IRS information, of chief counsel advice, 2005 or 2015-4-11, that specifically states knows 263A. So I don't like it. But it, it doesn't matter if I like it. It's the law. It's what the IRS says. Make careful note of how those two things differ. It, 263 cannot be applied. And then the champ case. You should all know it because California gave it to us. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's not current, but it's relevant. July 20th, the dispensary lost a case basing its deductions on champs. That was six days ago. Still relevant, still being argued, lost. And again, the 16th Amendment doesn't apply. They can, in fact, actually remain calm. They lost on that, too. If you plan on advising or working with the industrial hemp or the hemp extract industry, again, you need to know the Controlled Substance Act's definition of a cannabis extract. And, can and, and cannabis itself are called marijuana. There's an agent, I'm not sure why. DEA positions are different. FDA positions are different than the cannabis industry. There's a lot of uncertainty. The 2014 Farm Bill has created uncertainty because the 2018 Farm Bill is trying to supersede it. Hasn't won yet. A lot of problems. And then go back and read it all again. And again and again and again and again. It might not change, but it's really, you can't read it often enough. So, and like we've said before, in addition, my colleague and I are getting ready to put CPE together because I haven't been able to find any I can rely on. I have 500 hours into my tax position. I've been doing this since 2012. And I'll stand behind and go to court on any tax position I put down because that's our job, is to be able to defend it if we're going to put it on a tax return. That's how we help bring legitimacy to this industry, is we bring our acronym to the tax, and we say, we stand next to these people. They're not just drug dealers, they're tax-paying citizens as well. So, most importantly, know thy client, know thy regulatory environment, know thy tax code, know thyself. 
This industry is not for everyone. It's not just a green rush that you can get into and get out of. It's complicated. It takes time. You can, in fact, lose your shorts on these clients, and you can, in fact, be charged for helping them file this tax return. Don't put yourself in that position. But this industry is in desperate need of qualified tax professionals. Qualified. It needs you to jump into the adventure and help navigate very deep and expensive, complicated tax waters for these folks. Your clients need to be savvy, well-educated business people, and you can only lead them in that if you know what you're talking about, and you can hold a boundary with them, and you can have difficult, uncomfortable decisions, conversations with them. They already are comfortable not filing a tax return. You have to help them become comfortable filing a tax return. I'd like to see more tax professionals approach the industry professionally, not with this gold rush mentality that says, well, I'm going to do it, just get it done, make our money, get out of us. I'm amending those tax return positions made by CPAs in my state right now. If someone says to you that 83% of their costs are cost of goods sold for a dispensary, you should really question the number of people. You can't just believe it. You've got to get in the books. You've got to get in the records. You have to apply the professional acumen you already have to this industry. Over and over again, cases are being upheld that give the IRC 280E position more and more strength. We need to beat that tax code using the tax code, not around it, inside of it. It will change, but not right now. So, I've learned a lot of valuable things working for the industry. I've learned a lot of valuable things about myself. What some of the things I've learned are that I'm capable of holding those boundaries. I am capable of having those difficult conversations. That's fine. And no, no matter how palatable the content, or unpalatable the content, you're still a professional in it. So know thyself. And then you're going to be able to help with that at this point. Thanks, guys. Are there any questions? Questions? Hands up? Yeah. Do you require the job? Do you require the client to have an attorney for his first day? Yeah, I do. The attorneys are my number one client referral, so I worked in the court industry in 2003 and met all of these criminal defense attorneys, and all of those criminal defense attorneys refer clients to me. I then went and found a tax attorney that I sat down off, off of the dollars record and said, I want to work with this industry, I need you to help me. Let me talk about 280. You go read the tax code and tell me what you think, and I'm going to show you my tax position. And now we we, we work with other tax attorneys in order to be able to, to get them to understand the tax position and be able to then advise clients. Because the hierarchical structure of a holding company and all these disregarded entities and all these sorts of things that are making giant messes everywhere don't count. And when you get a good attorney, to be able to try to work inside the boundaries, it helps a lot. Any questions? Just to just add on what she was saying. So there definitely is a spectrum with it in regard to size of business. And she's from the Portland area, which is metropolitan. A lot of bigger companies, investment com you know, investors coming in. I suspect California is going to have a lot more of that kind of thing where there's uh, large investments. And so that takes a lot more sophistication. It does require the guidance of legal help. And I would definitely recommend that all businesses, all businesses in this industry, you, you talk to a, a, a lawyer, just much the same as regular businesses, especially those that are more vastly complex. Um, when the, in Southern Oregon, I have a lot of like one owner farmers, and all they have is a mom and pop farm and then they need a little bit of guidance and, and they you know and they need a tax return done. Um, uh, Katie comes from 
comes more from like the bookkeeping's perspective, making sure that there's sophistication in the bookkeeping and those kinds of things. I come from like training my clients. I can I have offer services where we train our clients to do the bookkeeping, but then oftentimes I do bring a third party bookkeeper in to make sure that it's up to the standards that I need in order to prepare an accurate tax return, taking into consideration to it. So there is a spectrum. And sometimes we need to, to hire larger firms, sometimes you just need a, a general business practitioner for for legal help. So Hi. Hi. Um, so I call them the big five. There's, in Oregon they call them producers, which are the farmers. So producers, extractors, wholesalers, dispensary, and then equitable topical folks tend to be the, the categories that I end up dealing with. Yeah, each one is it's, it's somewhat different from each other. So I have a standardized chart account that I use for each one of them because, again, cost of goods sold is the meat and the, the nuance of cost of goods sold in my methodology is where you support the tax return number because you, all you have are revenue, cost of goods sold, gross profit. I make them do bookkeeping all the way to the bottom line because that deals with cash. And to reconcile that and forth. So yeah. That. But, you know, and it gives me the ability to be able to look at where they're spending their money and say, hey, don't take the entire firm to MJ BizCon for 10 grand. You can't deduct the travel. Yeah. Pardon me? There must be an inventory. Cost of goods sold requires an inventory position. Nope. It just it's all it's all FIFO. Yep. Is there is there a debate on what cost sold expenses like how is that 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 depends on the person? Is there any standards for the state or something? The state hasn't given me any guidance on that. That's the, the 471. I mean, I think you'll find, as with every tax practitioner, you're going to have a spectrum upon which you're you're finding comfort. I mean, Code Section 471 clearly says direct materials, direct labor, and then a limited overhead position goes into COSA. It goes into the cost of goods sold, beginning inventory, ending inventory. You have yeah. two questions. I, oh, sorry, did you have that? Yeah, I did want to add on to that. It's kind of an interesting story. Several years ago, I went to continue education in Denver, Colorado, and I, I went there telling me, like, tell me how to do this, because I'm a little insecure about how I'm positioned. And it turns out that we were all there like, well, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? Like, we, we were coming up with kind of like a standard of doing it. And so, and it still is kind of that way. They're really, I mean, you it, it can, it's, it's black and white the way that it's, where the way it is laid out, but you know we just have we have to also be reasonable. Like the dispensaries, if you, if you take it by the book, one hundred percent, they will not be able to be in business. It is way too prohibitive. So they can. Uh, two questions. I assume the non-deductible SG&A is a and then the second question is, as a dispensary, they are a little mini Walmart. They've got all their products on the shelf, and Walmart, have, you know, in the distribution center in Walmart, when they're buying it, they've got their landed costs, which is their cost of its sold. How in the dispensary are you taking, which is a full retail business, moving that up into cost of its sold? Well, <laughs> it depends. The accounting answer, of course, it depends. So, my clients and most of the clients that I deal with because they are under, I think my largest client is $11 million and it's an extracting business. Um, I don't deal with a lot of expenses because they don't like my tax position. And he can answer that. But I require them to do square footage calculations with a floor plan 
and we take those costs, and I take the amount of square footage, I think has a direct relevance to that product, not selling that product, but securing that product, and that's an amount, allowable amount of rent and other overhead expenses might possibly go to that. Um, my position for dispensaries is really restricted because the IRS has said that, that the only deduction they get is the purchase of cannabis. Now, I think that number's wrong, but we can't get to, you know, something that's a lot looser than that unless you want to try to really defend it under audit. So, so my position, I have a little, I take a little bit more risk with that. So I have, I have a couple of spreadsheets. I allocate payroll based on what they're doing, if they're handling inventory, if they're processing, like a lot of the rolling joints. So as long as that time is spent rolling jo joints, I encourage them to have documentation. They often don't. So what I do is I have a list all their employees, their wages, their their taxes, and I say, okay, allocate, allocate it. What are they doing? Are they selling? Are they administration? Are they handling inventory? Are they purchasing, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And then I will take the deductible parts of that payroll. Um, at, but, but, but I don't think that's allowed according to the according to books. They, it's a lot more restrictive than that. So then also square footage is important. So if they're if they've got paraphernalia, for example, and part of their business is selling paraphernalia, I, I try to tell them to like maximize paraphernalia, maximize other non-medicated uh, medicated products, and try to maximize that on their sales floor. Then you can take a larger portion of those facility expenses. I even apply it to advertising expenses. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> to do the work, to do right by the industry. You've had a question forever. What, what's going on? Um, hi. You had mentioned that one tactic you would use is uh, encouraging your clients to put more of their business on the side of paraphernalia, but didn't the case in Olive kind of tell us that we aren't allowed to have them do that? Well, that one, they, they already had stuck their neck out by not even taking into consideration to it. It was after they had went to tax court that they're like, okay, well let's let's go ahead and, and uh, you know apply the paraphernalia rule. Um, I I guess you know uh, I I'm not sure I, I'm going to continue doing it through my methodology because I feel like it's I feel like it's reasonable and fair. Yeah. Under your methodology, do you separate the two businesses like the gentleman? up front somewhere was asking or do you do it on the no, same no, actually, I, I encourage it to be commingled in there I, I encourage that the square footage that of the cannabis is as small as possible and the other sales to, it doesn't have to be paraphernalia like glass and papers it can be as long as it's for the uh, for the purpose of generating income you know, there's a lot of branded materials, there's a lot of artwork, there's a lot of different kinds of things that your clients can put in there. Some, some places are really classy when you go in there. It's very classy. Like I said, some of the dispensaries we have in Southern Oregon, you can take your grandmother there. There's like appointments and all sorts of different things. That is all square footage that can be applied to the facility expenses at least at least, and you can take a, a, a proportion of the square footage. You just have to do it right, and you have to consult your clients to be kind of discreet. If they're like, if their advertising is like, we sell weed and that's what we do, then that's the, you know, which it's fine, and it's competitive. So, so you're going to be a little bit more conservative in regard to how they do their thing. When you've been with revenue agents, though, and just, but I think the point that's missed just that, but so, so the point that I think is important that, that isn't been explicitly stated is we're requiring, and my position is different than his, mind you, on, on square footage, but we're requiring the clients to do it contemporaneously. If my, I, I, I tell my clients all the time, the more work you're willing to do to document why this expense is deductible, the more willing I am to put it on a tax return for you. But if you do zero, the IRS has been clear, the answer is zero. So you can't be lazy in this, you can't just be growing me. You have to actually also have some business acumen and sense.
I, I just want to say one more thing so I don't get myself in trouble. I mean, you just have to understand your client's risk tolerance and size matters in this regard. Like you're probably going to do things a little differently for your one dispensary client versus your chain of clients. And especially in California, I, I don't know if California is much different than Oregon, but you know, depending on how much money is being invested in these things and how many owners there are, and how many companies are nested within another company and those kinds of things. I mean, there's definitely value in each approach. And you just have to weigh what approach is going to be the best for your clients and for you. And your, so you can sleep at night, too. I think we're about done. We've got to take one more. Oh, you've got two. Two minutes? We got to do a crossover. Anybody else? Yeah. So, where I live, there's a lot of um, a lot of medicinal and other growing happening, and I have a lot of clients that, frankly, you know, I've got contractors. There are a lot of other industries that are working with them, um, IT companies, and the client the clients come to me and say, "What do I do with this cash? How far do I need to be removed to make it paid in cash?" How far do they have to be removed in order to, to really deal with the banking side of that? It's unclear. I bank. I've been I've been clear with my credit union that I work with a, a wide variety of clients, some of which are canvas. Um, I, I again think that transparency is the best approach. If they were to throw me out of my credit union, I deal. I mean, I, I would find the way to, to, to work, go to the, the canvas compliant credit union and work with that. I mean, the answer is we don't know. I think that. For those of us that passed the CPA exam, I mean, my, my approach to it was um, whatever benefits the government the most is probably the answer to the question on the exam. I'm going to say the same thing probably applies here. Whatever benefit, if the government has the resource to be able to sue you to death. So if you want to go out on a limb, please, please go. I mean, normally. I have a cannabis client in, in Montana that's growing hemp, and she has jumped through all the hoops after four years to have federally compliant CBD extract. But it's cost her a ton, and she's gone to court a lot. So, you know, there are resources, and I think as this industry expands, and I think as, the, as California has the right and the strength to be able to meet the federal government in court, in economics, in the marketplace, it's going to be able to be the big mover and uh, you know purveyor in making change in this arena, um, which is why I'm excited that California decided to join this because it really adds so much strength and credence to this becoming a legit industry because California has blessed it. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Anybody else? Are we going to be wrapping it up? Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you.